with the help of some editors at the New York Times, pretty much dominate the dining section for a year and a half. So I got to shoot like all the pretty food pictures and meet all of the chefs and everybody that was working in LA. So within uh, like six, seven months of moving, all of a sudden people were hearing my name and seeing my work in a way that would not have happened um, without that that introduction to the New York Times. And that's why I saw your work as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so after that happened, after I did my like year and a half of shooting pretty pictures, I knew that I wanted to move back into the space of figuring out how to use food as a subject to have really robust uh, conversations about race, gender, sexuality, and class. So um, I do stuff like this, which is really awesome. Like I get sent to Mexico to photograph resorts and, um, and like restaurants that open up, but then I'm also working towards shooting more in-depth reporting stories. Um, I write also, so I'm constantly pitching things. So I don't know if we'll get to these images. That was photographed in Oaxaca on an artist retreat, um, run by this company called Popa Poco. And it was, it was built as an artist retreat. Everyone there was supposed to be an artist working on something. It didn't quite pan out that way, but it worked out really nicely for me because I wanted to go um, after having done some research about um, the emergence of the emergence of um, pride regarding Afro Latinx people, and I thought that it was a story that I needed to shoot. And then I got to Oaxaca and I started talking to people and figured out pretty quickly that it was not my story to shoot. Um, but I also figured out that there was a story here in the States that I needed to be shooting regarding food and culture and blackness. So uh, about a month ago, Getty Images granted me a $5,000 grant to start a project that is Atlantic Slave Trade shaped on American food days. So I'm working on that um, at the moment, and I'll be in New Orleans shooting a bit um, in and out of the, the South, where I grew up, a place that I have very tenuous ties to. Um, Can you talk a little bit about your story that you did for California Sunday Magazine? Because I really yeah. love that story. <laughs> yes, I really love it. So when I moved to LA, I met this woman who was working at the LA Times. She's a good friend of mine. Her name is Stephanie Mollenkopf. She was working, she had been working in Watts for about five and a half years. And there was this guy who was billed as the king of quesadillas. <laughs> and he was literally like cooking quesadillas in front of his mom's house, in, like in front of her uh, garage in Compton. And people were coming from all over the city to eat the quesadillas. And if you don't know, or as you know, there's a complicated history regarding South Central LA. So the city's like trying to rebrand it. They're calling it South LA now to kind of distance it from its past history of gun violence and, and gang activity. Um, and so the thing that I really liked about this guy, outside of the fact that his food was amazing, was he was a real advocate for forcing the media to continue to call South Central what it was, which was South Central. And his whole thing was like, you know, yeah, we had a tough past, but that doesn't mean that there isn't anything uh, worthy here. There's a lot going on if people would just come and see it. So I never got a chance to eat his quesadillas, unfortunately, <laughs> on his Instagram, because I was curious to see if there were other black people who were cooking in this manner in South Central. Um, and there were a ton of them. But I sat on the pitch because I was like, this is, someone's going to snatch this up. It's going to get oversaturated, overreported, so it just didn't feel right. Um, and then, was it last year? Yeah, last January, Thrillist put out a list of like 10 underground chefs in LA that you should, you know, go check out. And the quesadilla guy was on the list. I was like, all right, all right, I had this pitch as a story for the California Sunday. Um, so something just told me, like, just, just go reach out and see what happens. Now, I had been constantly sending emails to the California Sunday, like, for that, for a year, and never heard anything. When I went to the website, I found that um, they hired a new photo editor, so I reached out to her directly, and I pitched one fine dining story about some chef that had moved from Chicago to L.A., because I photographed his wedding, so I was like, I have a connection there. 
Um, and then I pitched the story about these un underground chefs cooking out of South Central. She liked the idea that they were getting ready to close out an issue, so she's like, I don't have the bandwidth right now. I think both of these ideas are great. Just sit tight and I'll get back to you. So given my, my history of sending emails and not getting responses, I was like, I'm never gonna hear shit about this. Um, and I was right, it was right at the precipice where I was like, okay, am I gonna shoot this on my own and then see what happens, or am I gonna wait for the California Sunday? Out of the clear blue sky, a writer who I still haven't met pitched the exact same story, and she named four out of the five chefs that I knew. So Paloma came back to me, and she's like, if you're pitching that story, stop. We want it. I need to know what your schedule is. We need to get the ball rolling on this. Um, so it was a week and a half of shooting, about eight to 12 hour days following five chefs around from Compton, Gardena, uh, Long Beach, and Inglewood. And in the process of shooting it, I think we do. Yeah, I'm sure I tossed some in there. Not at all. <laughs> it's still out. It's, and, yeah, it's, it's, it's all can go and, and check it out. It's a really beautifully shot and lit story. Um, yeah, so long story short, there were a couple of challenges that came in regards to shooting the story. Um, one was that I would, like, was shooting these 8 to 12 hour days, so it was a lot of imagery to go through. Um, the photo editor who was working with me ended up leaving on vacation when the wide edit was due for the high res order. So this meant that I was now working with the photo director who had been ignoring my emails for a year and a half. <laughs> um, so high res order comes around and she asked me for 40 images. To put this into perspective, when I'm shooting a story for the New York Times and they're gonna select between three and five images, they get a high-res order of 40 images to choose from. When you're shooting a magazine feature, on average, your photo director or photo editor should be asking you for about 10% of what you're shooting. I shot 1,200 images, so she should have asked for about 120 pictures. I had to then have the, the conversation of, Hey, I know we haven't talked. I know you probably didn't want me on this assignment, but I shot the assignment. The work is really good. I want to do justice to the story. She had not picked any portraits of the chefs. It's a story about chefs. You can't not have portraits of the chefs. There's no context. Um, so I basically had to say, like, hey, I added in some extra images because the stuff that you picked they were like supporting images. There was no context. There's no way of giving people credit for the amazing work that they're doing. And I hope that you will treat my piece with the same respect that you treat every other piece that comes through your desk. They didn't say anything to me. I didn't hear anything until the piece came out. I ended up getting a 14-page feature, which is the largest feature they've had in the magazine today. Um, it's the August 2017 issue. They have everything online, so you can see a widespread of that there. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming out tonight. Um, my name is Jaffa Keke, and um, I'm from LA. I'm from the city of LA. Um, I come from a Nigerian father and a Cuban and Jamaican mother, so it's very you know, very diasporic in nature. Um, and I've always been obsessed with just like culture and pride and um, I and adornment. Um, and that has been something that um, I kind of struggled with kind of growing up in America. And I'm sure people who are, you know, second generation often deal with this where you are kind of like in America, but then you go home and you guys talk different, you eat different, like you go to a certain African party, you guys have the rapa to the heaven, you know what I mean? And it's just like, it's different. And and so I almost, I, I dealt with a lot of like, not knowing and kind of like, I want to say identity crisis. It was really kind of difficult for me to kind of um, maneuver through the world. Um, and I was really close to my great grandmother who was the Caribbean grandmother and she would always have me over and she would just like adorn me with all these like carnival, I mean earrings and necklaces and all of this and she would just talk about our history, you know, she would talk about our history, she would tell me stories about my grandfather and um, 
And I just really felt this sense of pride kind of come up in me. Um, and so I started to adorn myself with what um, she had given me, and it really gave me a very, um, just a very kind of proud sense to be who I was, you know, and in, in living here in America. Um, and so I just kind of, and a lot of the work that I did, it was a very, not knowing, and kind of using a dorm and a culture of pride as a resistance, um, and just celebrate who we are. Um, and so I did a lot of work around, like, you know, who we are as Americans and, um, and what America really is. And so uh, there was an Indian writer um, that I read, and, and she um, had a poem, and she talked about, like, um, how a lot of times we're talk we we what is it called when we're like America is supposed to be this melting melting pot is actually not good because you have to distort who you are to become something else. And she was saying that what we are really we're a mosaic because everybody gets to keep who we are um, and become something bigger. And so like I was so obsessed with it. I'm like yeah 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 like that's what I've been trying to say this whole time. I, a lot of the work that I do is just really kind of wrapped around like um, being proud of who we are and um, just identity in general. And so, uh, yeah. And this, this is like, I do all type of work, but um, I, I really have a heart for portraiture. And so in my portraiture, you'll see a lot of like, a lot of the, um, the subjects have this something in their eyes, like I'm here, this is who I am and I'm not going anywhere. Um, and yeah, so I encourage that in a lot.